Hi, everyone. Welcome to part two of our Advanced Ways to Protect Your Data webinar from Revolution Group. This webinar will focus on sensitive information storage and how to keep data protected with your remote employees. My name is Molly Darrow, and I am the Marketing Specialist for the Technology Services Division. For those of you who aren't familiar with Revolution Group, we're a technology consulting firm in Westerville, Ohio, specializing in managed IT services, Salesforce consulting services, and manufacturing ERP services. Our technology services division offers small to medium-sized businesses a full line of managed services from 24-7 help desk support to project work, account management, and virtual CIO expertise. The Salesforce Services Division provides innovative Salesforce CRM consulting, implementation and integration solutions that enhance sales and elevate customer service to maximize your ROI. Our comprehensive manufacturing ERP consulting services include system selection and implementation, optimization, and extended application development for disparate business system integrations. A few housekeeping items before we start the webinar. This webinar will be recorded and available on our website at www.revolutiongroup.com. The recording will also be emailed to you at the completion of this webinar, along with a two-minute survey letting us know if you enjoyed the webinar and topic. Um, as a side note, please do take a second to fill out these surveys. Um, you can just suggest new webinar topics you would like to see from us. And that way we can continue to provide you with the most valuable information to you and, and what's relevant right now for your company. We have allotted an hour for this webinar, but this particular webinar today should only take about 30 to 40 minutes. We will be answering questions at the end, so please feel free to submit your questions into the section labeled questions on your GoToMeeting panel at any time. Now our presenter. Ryan Mavis has over 10 years of IT experience in positions ranging from service desk support to architecting cloud infrastructures and everything in between. Ryan is currently the team lead for Revolution Group's Network Operating Center team, better known as NOC, which is a team of reactive engineers. This team helps keep our customers up and running 365 days a year. So now I will pass it over to Ryan. Thanks, Molly. I am excited to be here. We had too much information last time to fit it into our one hour time slot. So this is part two. Um, so we did the last webinar a couple weeks ago. If you didn't get a chance to listen to it or watch it, um, check it out on our website. It was recorded. We went over encryption and two factor authentication. And it kind of ties into today's webinar, which is about sensitive information. So with that said, let's uh, get started. Um, I, I want to start off, um, think back to your first day on a job and how excited you were. You wanted to make a good first impression. So when HR asked you for your bank account details, your social security number, and your driver's license, you just happily handed it over. All of that information was personal identifiable information which is fine until you realize the HR folder is open to all the users in the company. People tend to assume <clears throat> that all their data will remain private because they trust their employer to keep it safe. Unfortunately, that faith can come up empty. Uh, I took a, a recent news story earlier this year, a uh, UK retailer called Sports Direct, they revealed that they had 30,000 unencrypted employee data files stolen. And they didn't tell their employees until after it was published in the news. Stories like this make the headlines way too often. And it hurts businesses, their employees, and their customers. And many of these times, it's not a random external attack. It could be something internal. And it might be somewhat innocent just because the records were less left open to anyone in the company. It's possible it could be someone malicious with a grudge to fill after getting fired or laid off, but if stuff's just left open, it makes it all too easy to, for it to get out into the world. 
losing sensitive information like this isn't acceptable. You shouldn't just assume that your data is safe. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So as an employer, you have all kinds of sensitive information. It may be employee information or customer information or just might be important business documents. I'd like to ask you, do you know where all of your sensitive information is being stored? What type of information is being kept on file? Or who has access to the personal information? Do you know when they are accessing that type of information? Or how or where they're accessing it from and if they're sharing it? When you hear these questions, do you think about your accounting files or your HR files? What about the files that only the executives should have access to or your payroll information? Do you know where all that is? Is it only on one of your file servers? Is it spread across a couple different servers? Is it in some sort of cloud storage like SharePoint or OneDrive? Is some of it stored in a vendor's application that's off-site? I hope none of it's stored on a end user's workstation, but we've seen worse. I ask these questions not to scare you, but to really bring up awareness and get you thinking about where your information is and what's important to you. In a recent Forrester study, there was 150 organizations asked if they knew where their employee data was located. Only 41% could actually answer that. And as I'll talk about in a little bit, it really goes beyond knowing where information is being stored. Too often, personal information finds its way into emails or other files, like an image of someone's driver's license shared over an email message. Or maybe there was some sort of software that was upgraded, and before they upgraded, they took a, a backup of the customer database, and maybe they didn't delete that backup after they were done. Do you have procedures in place instructing your staff on safe ways to share this type of information? Uh, sharing is um, a big topic that we'll talk about in a little bit as well. So a real double-edged sword of technology is that one of its main goals is to promote collaboration and make information easily accessible for everyone to work together on. That attitude is what has made technology become the asset that it is. However, when we're talking about today's topic, sensitive information or confidential information, this strength of collaboration and accessibility can really become a weakness. And we got to make sure we're prepared for it and that we're identifying it and putting in measures to protect against it. So I've asked a lot of questions. And really what you're asking is, what should you do? We really want to break it down into five key areas. There's, there's really five important areas you should take into consideration. That's classification, least privileged permissions, monitoring data access, data retention, and employee training. Let's take a step through each of these and I'll tell you what I'm talking about. Classification is our first key area. Over and above everything else, an organization needs to know exactly where all of its employee data and other sensitive information is being stored before they can even think about securing it. Again, is it on a Windows file share? Do you have an HR drive that's mapped to the HR computers? Do you have information in Dropbox or SharePoint? Or once again, do you use a third-party software and they have your customer database within their software? Is your payroll department outsourced? These are the questions you or your IT team should be asking and then documenting. Once you have a picture of where the information is, you can use automated tools. There are several tools out there that can actually scan that location you've identified and flag potentially sensitive information. And if there's information that's specific to your organization, you can normally input that string, whether it's some sort of a employee record number or something like that. You can import that string into the tool, and it can scan for that and identify when it's found on the company network. Our second topic is least privileged permissions. It's a topic you should really be familiar with. Uh, sometimes it's called least access privilege. Um, enforcing a least privilege model means employees only have access to the data they need to do their job. 
limiting access on this need to know basis and keeping those privileges up to date means that sensitive data is only viewed by those who truly need to see it. And this is really what we're mainly talking about today. So how do you start to develop this type of model? You need to get a current report of who currently has access to what. After you have that, you'll then be able to tell what adjustments need made, as in what groups or departments or people should have access to each piece of information in your organization. Once you're able to write all this down and map it out, you can sit down or share it with your IT team to implement the changes you see need made. The issue is doing this once doesn't mean you're done. Classifying your information or scanning who has access to it is something that should be done routinely, uh, whether it's quarter quarterly or yearly or constantly, depending on how sensitive your information is, you need to have procedures in place on who can approve access to the data. There's systems out there that allow you to appoint different employees as approvers of files and folders in their department, which then allows you to delegate some of these responsibilities to the right people, the people that know what information they need to do their job or what their subordinates need to do their job. One of the most important things you need to have is an employee onboarding or offboarding procedures. When an employee leaves, you need to have a procedure in place that makes sure any access they had is removed. And when a new employee starts, you need to decide what information that person needs. As an MSP provider, we find many times that a new employee will start and then the IT department will get an email and they'll be told that person needs the same access as Jane. Jane used to do this job, so they'll need the same access as her. That might be okay, but do you really know what all information Jane had access to? You should really be taking a deeper look and you should be only be giving the new employee access to what they need access to. Otherwise, you'll go down the spiral of keep giving them more and more access and eventually everyone has access to everything and that leads to the news headlines we see of all the information being stolen. Your IT team or your partner should be able to sit down with you and develop these type of procedures to get them written and that way they can be published and shared with the correct staff members and make sure that they're followed. Our third key area is monitoring data access. As a business matures, typically the use of sensitive data will get greater and greater, and thus that data should be monitored, that use of that data should be monitored. If data isn't monitored, how can you determine whether the correct people have access to it or whether access is being abused? If you're not already doing this, you should know that people or that there are additional products out there to help gather these statistics. You can work with your team or partner to help get a system in place. However, reviewing the information should be done by leadership. The IT team won't know or be able to know if someone is accessing information they shouldn't or if they're sharing files they shouldn't, they just don't have insight into that job role to know what should and shouldn't be accessed. So that's why it should always be done by the management or leadership team to review these reports and know who should be using what. A really good benefit of this type of monitoring is that it gives you the insight to people that are abusing information access or information they have access to. There may be a legitimate reason to give an accounting individual access to payroll information or payroll documents. However, if you have monitoring place, it could show that they're accessing that information much more often than you expected and thus lead you to question it and find out that it's actually being abused. They're using it in ways they shouldn't be. So monitoring data access can actually help you find or catch information leaks before they get too serious. Data retention is another big area we need to focus on when we're talking about sensitive information. You need to ensure that there's policies in place for data that is no longer required. For example, when an employee leaves, while it's necessary to retain some data of their employment or some record of their employment, there's a good chance that there's a lot of personal data related to them or personal files on their computer that they used that isn't needed anymore and it should be removed from the organization's records. 
This is another situation that we see come up quite often. I really feel too often organizations want to retain too much data. They want to retain everything they can. Why do they do this? Most likely because technology gives us the ability to do so. It allows us to retain everything with little cost. Um, the other option is maybe there's been times in the past that because they've retained all of their emails or all of the information, it's actually helped them solve a problem or a question that comes up later. That can be good, but is it really worth it? Because the more data you retain or the more data you keep around, that's the more data you're responsible for or the more things you're liable for. You really need to put thought in this decision and decide what information you really need to keep around. Also, I, I kind of talked about this in our last webinar, but when we're protecting information and you're talking about your sensitive information and identifying it and protecting it, you can kind of shoot yourself in the foot if you forget to look into your backup system. We talked about encryption in our last webinar and you really want to make sure that your data backup system is also encrypted because if it's not, you can go to all the work you want and applying, applying restrictions around your sensitive information, but if someone gets access to your data backup, it's all in vain. So just check on that, make sure your data backups are encrypted and that only the right people have access to the right data. Of the five key areas we listed, I'd say this last one's probably the most important one, and that's the importance of employee training. Employees really need to understand the value of the assets they're working with. Any employee coming into contact with sensitive information should be trained to use the systems and the controls that are there to protect the data. The employees need to understand the risk associated with the misuse of the data in your environment. When you're talking to your employees or you're training them, you should start simple and you should be talking to them about things like knowing if anyone can see your screen when you're looking at sensitive information or are they completely closing out of documents and applications when they're done? Do they lock their computer when they step away? You can implement a policy that automatically locks the computers after 10 minutes or so, but if they step away after five minutes of inactivity, that means there's a five minute window that someone could walk up and get access to the computer. So just teaching the, the Windows key and the L button of how to lock the computer when they step away could be a big benefit to keeping your data safe. If the employees talk about sensitive info over the phone to a customer, do they know who's in earshot? Is the employee in public and they're talking to a customer or someone else in the organization? Do they know who can hear what they're talking about? What do you do if a customer emails you credit card information or other sensitive information? These topics might sound basic, but there could be many employees in your organization that don't know how to handle these situations and it just takes one mess up. So with training, you give them a procedure to follow you go over these scenarios and they know how to handle them. And the real key to training is being repetitive. Only doing this once is gonna set you up for failure. Whether you're doing quarterly training, yearly training, or training when you onboard your employees, you just need to keep it going. So our second big subject for today is around sharing and employee training is a good segue into this. Yes, everyone needs to know how to share. Specifically, they need to know how to share confidential information and how to do it safely. We've been talking about how to store information, but that same information is very common to just transfer it or have a need to transfer that type of information. As a managed service provider, we have seen several examples of unsafe sharing. For instance, we talked to a medical practice that did, um, they stored their patient notes inside of a secure electronic medical record system, which is good. However, when the physicians had went over on their hours and they needed to claim that time, they had to write up an email and send it to an improver. And in that email, they included their notes of what they did, the patient notes and why they needed to stay longer or work over. But these emails weren't encrypted and it put that little bit of patient information at risk. So just knowing about that and them changing their procedures 
is all they had to do to resolve that and be more safe and not have that type of security risk out there. I'm trying to think uh, as another example, what about your HR department? Have they sent out um, a form for next year's insurance provider wanting to change insurance providers or the insurance provider needs updated information? And on that form, it asks for a social security number. We need to make sure there's some sort of mechanism in place to capture that information or that social security number securely and make sure that there aren't these social security numbers just floating around in emails and plain text. We need to have the right procedures in place. And a lot of times that may require getting a tool, but mainly you can just sit down with your IT team and try to develop these procedures. You don't really know what's going on until you sit down, think about it, and talk about it. So, I mean, the solution to this is really twofold. First, you need to have the right technology in place, the right tools that allow you to share this information securely. But then you also have to write down the procedures that tell your employees how to use these tools and what information is sensitive and needs to be put through the tools and what information is more or less public knowledge or we're not really um, – too concerned with how that information is shared. So as a side note, I mean, sensitive information can really be subjective at times. It's not always this type of email document is always sensitive, so send it through an encrypted channel. There's a lot of gray areas. And the best way to help your employees with this is to give examples of what may be gray, what type of situations may come up within your organizations, and give examples of how you would handle it. Leading by example is the best way to train employees on how to share information securely. So let's take a minute and actually talk about technology, specifically what tools or examples are out there of how to share information securely. Obviously, email is the most common way to share information between individuals, and a lot of times sensitive information is used with that. So a big popular tool right now is Office 365, in particular for email. If you're already in Office 365 and you have the enterprise licensing, that's the E3 or E1 licensing within Office 365, you can actually go ahead and implement rules that scan all of your inbound and outbound messages for information like credit cards, social security numbers, or important strings like that, phone numbers or whatnot, that are important to your company. So based on those rules scanning for that, you can have different actions take place. You could have the email blocked and it just notify a manager, or you could have the system automatically encrypt the message and then continue sending it on to its destination. Leveraging the tools you already have is really the best way. I mean, it's cheaper that way just to use the things you already have. You just need to make sure they're implemented properly. Uh, kind of in relation to Office 365, uh, a way to address another easy way to lose information is by sharing files. Microsoft has a system called Azure Information Protection. If you haven't really heard much about Azure, it's Microsoft's whole encompassing term for their cloud environment. Office 365 pretty much falls under Azure. And within that, one of their tools is called Azure Information Protection. That tool will scan your documents they could be in the cloud, on a file server, in SharePoint. It'll scan them for information that you've deemed sensitive and then automatically encrypt those files. So to share them, you can give access to only the people in your organization that need them. And if an employee needs to share the file, they then add someone else to that, whether it's an internal person or an external person, and send it probably through an email attachment, but the file is encrypted. Even after they send the file, they can control who has access to it and revoke access to that file. They can put on an expiration time so the message will self-destruct after three days. And you can also track it. You can see who accessed the file, when they accessed it, and who tried and who was denied. And that could lead you into who's trying to access information they couldn't. This Azure Information Protection System, it works best for companies that already have a presence in Office 365 because it's just an additional subscription and then the time it takes to get that set up and train people how to use it. 
these are just two examples of tools that we could be using or should be using to share information back and forth. Once again, you'll want to get with your team or your partner to sit down and talk about what tools meet your requirements, what work with the applications that you already have in your business. Other things to think about are mobile device management or mobile app management systems. For an IT administrator, the world of information security has really changed over the past 10 years. IT admins used to have to only worry about protecting information on the devices that were inside of their company. And they could pretty much do that by deploying a computer policy that locked down the computers and they just had to monitor the information going around with inside the organization. But now that's, that's really changed. No longer are all the business devices inside the four walls of the main headquarters or the main location of the business. Company information is being spread across all kinds of devices like smartphones or tablets, maybe laptops or actually personal computers that employees are using from home or shared computers. Information is finding its way on all kinds of different devices. These technologies like mobile device management and mobile app management make it a lot easier for IT admins to lock it down. And they can also do it in a way that's not as intrusive to the users. Uh, for example, there's a, if you do a mobile app management, instead of locking down an entire employee's phone to where they have to enter a PIN or password when they unlock the phone, you can actually just have your business app or your Outlook app, if you're in Microsoft 365, actually ask for the PIN or passcode. So the employee can still use the phone as they want, but if they want to access the business email, they open up the Outlook app and they have to put in a PIN or a fingerprint to get into the app. It makes it a little easier, a little more pal palatable for people to allow that type of management on their devices. There's really a lot of different vendors out there with these software projects or products and device management systems, but they all just have a way to lock down the devices and lock down your data on the devices and give you the ability to wipe that information off should it get lost, stolen, or if it's not needed anymore. That way you're not worried about your company information being in the hands of someone else. Once again, when it comes to sharing the information, it's always important to have a procedure in place instructing your employees on how to do it safely. Our last topic for today centers around working remotely. Having employees work from home is fairly commonplace now. Many organizations see it as an opportunity to provide their employees with a better work-life balance or give them benefits they didn't have before, while the business is still getting everything they need out of their staff. Working from home or remote work, it gives you the ability for your business to start gaining a presence in other markets without spending the capital on maybe like a building or a location. And it can also give you a different avenue to attract talent from anywhere. There might be someone in Texas or another country that has a skill set you need, you want that in your organization. And if you have a working procedure in place to allow them to work remotely, you can have them. So when you're thinking about working remotely, there's really some considerations you, just, you should take into account. I wanna go through a bunch of these as I'm sure you wanna make sure your information is safe and it's not put in jeopardy when your employees are working from home. So the first question is, whose equipment? Are you going to be providing a computer to your employee for them to use when they're at home? And that adds an extra expense to the business, and it'll be another system for your team to maintain. Or will you employ more of a BYOD policy, a bring-your-own-device policy, which is common in today's world, especially with the mobile devices, and that's where your employee will provide their own computer equipment. But then the question becomes, is it safe for them to have company information on their own computer? Do you have a policy saying that you're not going to maintain that system? What really comes down to the biggest question in deciding those two, two options is, what information will the employee be working with? Will they be working with information that's more public knowledge and you're not too concerned about it? Or will they be treated with the same information that your internal staff works with and it's very secure? 
Most likely it's the latter. Most likely they're working with secure information. So if you're providing a em computer for the employee to work from, there's a good chance the computer can be locked down by the same computer policy as your internal PCs. You just need to make sure that the connection from the employee's home to the office is encrypted. Uh, just like we talked about in our last webinar, the VPN or virtual private network connection is one of the best solutions for that. Your IT team or partner could help get that set up and implemented. But if you really don't want the expense of providing or managing a uh, computer for the remote employees, a terminal server is typically the best answer. A terminal server can be connected to from most any computer. When an employee connects, they are presented with a full screen window that gives them a full desktop they can work within. And with a terminal server, no company information is ever stored on the employee's computer, whether that is a, a computer you provided or not, or a public computer. There's no company information actually stored on it. And the connection from the computer to the terminal server is secure, it's encrypted, it's safe. The best part is if for any reason you actually need to terminate access from that employee to the terminal server, you can do so instantly. There's many versions of this solution or even a VPN connection. So again, work with your team to decide what tool or method is the best for your organization. A couple other considerations to think about is what is the environment like that the employee is going to be working from? Is their workspace actually safe from prying eyes? It sounds kind of uh, elementary, but you need to think about it. Who else will have access to this employee's computer? Will there be travel from this employee? If so, they'll probably be using mobile devices or portable devices. Once again, these devices are easily lost or stolen, and if they have company information on them, you want to make sure you have an MDM system that's able to wipe them remotely. Or at the very best, maybe track them down and get them back. The most important point for work from home employees is to teach them safe computing practices. Just like I said before, it's as simple as paying attention to who's around when they're working with sensitive information or who can hear them over the phone and to make sure that they lock their device when they're away from it. Remote work can really be a good fit for many positions in several different organizations. You just need to make sure it's done safely and securely. So this really wraps up our two-part webinar series. Today we, we talked about sensitive information and you really need to find out where it's stored and identify what information is actually sensitive to you. Once you have that scope, you can talk with your team and decide if there's products out there to automatically classify that information and to make sure you're only giving access to the people that need access. We talked about how sharing sensitive information can be a big security risk and what you need to consider when you're looking in that. And then also, if you have remote employees or if you're thinking about remote employees, what consideration you need to take into account for when you're putting that in place. I really hope you've gotten value out of these two webinars, and I really want to thank you for your time. I'll hand it over to Molly to actually finish up here. Thank you, Ryan. <clears throat> As promised, I think we're around right between 2.35, so <laughs> right on time here. That's right. Um, before we go, though, it does look like a few of you submitted some questions. Give me a second to pull those up. I like questions. You do? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the first one we have here are, um, so with everything you brought up today, what should be the first thing I have my team start doing? Um, I mean, that's a great question. That's kind of what I was referring to at the end there. I mean, really building a scope is really the first thing you need to work on. You need to identify what information is important to you and at the very most, know where everything is being stored. Where is your presence, uh, your technology presence? Is it all within inside your building or a data center? Is it cloud? Where is it all? And documenting that is your first step. Most likely when you document that, 
you're going to raise red flags as why is this here? Why is this easily accessible? Why do these people have access to it? And that's the stuff we want to try to fix. Anything else? I think that answered that question. Yeah. Um, Was there any other? There are. There are a couple more. So um, you had mentioned reporting tools during the presentation, Ryan. This person asks, what reporting tools can be used to monitor who has access to files? Um, I don't want to assume. I mean, most organizations are more of a Microsoft shop and they have a Microsoft file server. So there are some features you can actually, they're not enabled by default, but you can actually have your team turn on and track some statistics on file access. But it's probably best to give us a call or sit down with your team and understand what applications, what systems you have in place. And then there's a variety of tools you can implement. But most people are probably in a Microsoft uh, solution. So there's probably just some file um, tracking tools that just need to be enabled or features that need to be enabled. OK. Um, and last one here, um, I have reason to believe sensitive information at our company may have been compromised. What should we do? <laughs> Give us a call. Um, I'm kind of serious, though. G give us a call or reach out to your IT team. I mean, if you're really concerned about something being compromised, most likely the first step is to cut off access to that information. Unless you know exactly how it was compromised or who compromised it, you probably want to shut down access first and then slowly give access back to only the people or the things that need that access. But Every situation is different, so that's why I recommend giving us a call or reaching out to your IT team so we can get a full picture of what's going on there. Okay. Um, that was it. That was all the questions that came in. So that concludes part two of our Advanced Ways to Protect Your Data webinar. Thank you for attending. And like Ryan said, we hope you really got valuable information on how to safely store vendor, employee, and, and client information. So enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.